Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about emergency communications, and we were just getting into priorities. And I'm going to throw it over to you, Jody, and uh, tell us what your priorities are for the IPAWS program over the next couple of years. Sure. Um, our priorities, number one, is we are looking to improve the IPAWS reliability, make the system more robust by moving and migrating to a secure cloud environment. Our next priority is looking to employ methods to support the requirements laid out in the National Defense Authorization Act. So we are required to develop plans to develop new IPAWS compatible software certification program, also to provide annual user training and certification, and also to employ some type of system or method to improve crafting of messages to help our locals design better, more effective messaging to the public. Fantastic, and that's uh, super important to be able to have that type of capability. I'm glad to see that the IPAWS program is looking at this. Uh, Nick, how about at Verizon? I know you guys are in a, into a lot of different things there. I'm sure you've got just a ton of priorities. Give us the top line as to what the priority is for Verizon over the next couple of years. Yeah, it really breaks down into two very simple priorities. One is delivering on the trust that public safety has given us, and that's continuing to maintain a, an incredibly reliable network. Uh, that's continuing to uh, make sure that we have battery backup at all of our cell sites, generator backup at almost all of our cell sites, and deploying our Verizon response team uh, out as we have in over 1,400 different engagements since the beginning of the year, leaving equipment, delivering equipment for public safety first responders to use. So it's continuing to deliver on the reliability on the network that first responders trust. But where we're going in the next one to two years really is the investments in 5G. And certainly there's the investment in actually building the network, right? So putting fiber in the ground to be able to backhaul all the traffic coming from 5G small cells, but then also investing in new technologies like dynamic spectrum sharing so that we can leverage both the 4G and the 5G spectrum to deliver 5G in more places. But what I'm really excited about, what my focus is for the next couple of years, is going to be delivering solutions for first responders. So the 5G network is great, but it's not just a faster network. It's not just a lower latency network. It's actually a network that's going to deliver real solutions, meaningful uh, improvements to the way first responders and public safety work. Uh, and, uh, and execute their mission. So what I'm really excited about is bringing those solutions to market that are going to really be game changers for first responders. Fantastic. And delivering the goods to those responders uh, when they need it, where they need it. I think that's awesome. Uh, we're going to talk about lessons learned. And what I'd like to say here is on these lessons learned, it can be, you know, sort of, uh, uh, obviously, I, I, I wish we had done it this way, but it can also be, hey, you know, we didn't even think of this and, and Here's a real positive. Uh, so Lori, I'm gonna start with you. I'm sure there's got to be lessons learned uh, from the National 911 program. It's been around 50 years. Give us some lessons learned, top two. Well, I think, well, Frank, I think the, the top lesson that we have learned over the years is that it, it, it is, I think there's a temptation to focus on the technology, you know, the shiny object that's coming down the pike, but really, what we've learned is so important is not so much the, the what, uh, but the who. Uh, one of the things that uh, has become really important to us over the years is going to our stakeholders to help us identify the projects that need our attention and our focus and our resources. And we also include them in the development of those projects because at the end of the day, we hand everything back to them to use. So if it doesn't pass the laugh test, if they're never going to use it, it's worthless. Um, and that, that includes the private sector as well. I think that's another lesson that we've learned. Um, at the end of the day, it's got to work for everybody. And, and while you know, the, the viewpoints of local and state government uh, are very important, uh, very often private sector companies have a, have a national perspective they have a lot of experience and that has been invaluable to include in the projects that we have deployed over the last few years. Well, we really have learned that, right? It's gotta be reliable, it has to be secure, but boy, it has to be easy to use uh, in, 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 when you're in an emergency, right? It just has to be easy to use. Okay, uh, Jody, how about lessons learned at IPAWS? I would say that we've learned um, over the, I've learned over the years working with our local users is the constant and consistent need of engaging with your users and your community. 
knowing their needs and um, applying your methods to meet those needs of your users. And this needs to be built, um, they need to build and sustain collaborative relationships with all of their stakeholders. And this can be gained through performing um, training exercises and involving everybody around the table when you're trying to design your best plans and your response methods. That's really what we find, I find that challenging, but we promote that and we find that that has been a really strong lesson learned. Fantastic, and uh, you know, you, you gotta keep the entire community and uh, involved and you have to be, uh, uh, make sure you've been inclusive to the entire community to make sure the program's successful, right? Um, okay, well, we're gonna start to, uh, to uh, wrap it up here and we always like to close out with uh, uh, a question regarding uh, what does the future look like, right? What does it look like uh, around the corner, over the bend, over the horizon a little bit? Uh, we're gonna start with you, Chris, at Comscope um, you know, if you could paint a picture out there and tell us what it looks like in three years, uh, what are we going to be seeing? What kind of capabilities is Comscope going to be delivering at that point? Well, if, if, I, if I look at that, uh, you know, I, I would say a more ubiquitous experience, um, um, easier managed transition between all these communication methods. So, you know, one of the advantages of having all these different technologies is making it simpler for the government to use, right? So bringing, you know, the Wi-Fi, the LTE, CBRS, communications all under one umbrella, um, you know, 5G with the small cell and the bandwidth, that, that that's gonna bring, you said it's gonna bring a lot of, of new solutions on, but, you know, um, it's not about any one communication method, I think, um, at, at that point, it's about how I get redundancies in the system and, and can use all of them. If you look at the, the devices coming out, they, they don't support one of these technologies, they support all of them in a single handset. So having a, um, a management system, you know, overall that combines all those technologies, we feel Comscope's in a unique position to do that going forward. Fantastic. Some capability to just tie it all together with uh, this sort of complex ecosystem, again, to make it easy when you need to use it. Nicholas, how about at Verizon? What does it look like in three years uh, when, uh, you know, we have another uh, an event, another occurrence, another emergency, another hurricane? You know, uh, what does it look like in regards to uh, Verizon's part of that? Yeah, we're building that future now. I lead our 5G first responder lab program here at Verizon, where we're looking at new technologies that are going to be able to leverage 5G uh, and really take advantage of the capabilities that are coming that, that can fall back on 4G, certainly, because that network's not going anywhere for a long time. But the advantages of 5G are going to be able, be able to enable new solutions uh, like fiber-like connectivity to mobile command centers and having essentially what looks and feels like a fiber circuit uh, out to a mobile command center could be really game-changing, as well as backhaul for video surveillance cameras that don't need, uh, don't need to bring a fiber line or connectivity to it, but uh, actually backhauling on 5G. And then it enables new solutions that we're testing in our lab with uh, drones and augmented reality for heads-up displays during uh, during the mission, uh, or virtual reality for for new training methods out in the field. So there's a lot of new things that are going to be enabled over 5G that we're really excited to be able to bring to market in the next few years, and working hand in hand with first responders to develop these technologies. And just for kicks and the awareness of our audience, difference between 4G and 5G. Yeah, the biggest thing that most people think about is speed. What we really think about and we're really excited about is latency. So the ability to ping the network, but also to put storage analytics and uh, in the network at the edge. So being able to leverage a quicker connection actually means better processing in the network of the data that you're that you're pulling in and, and, uh, and ingesting at the edge. How much faster is 5G than 4G, roughly? It depends on who, who you're asking and what 5G network. And not all 5G networks built the same, but our 5G ultra wideband network is, uh, is over a gig per second. And what we're seeing in, in live field tests uh, and our LTE network is uh, generally in the 100 megabits per second. So at least 10 times faster, sometimes up to a thousand times faster. Wow. Thank you very much. Jeff, how about a Panasonic? You talked about a lot of things that you all are doing over there. What are we going to see uh, Panasonic delivering in three years? 
three years well you know here we uh, take pride in the fact that we design products for customer needs so uh, right now we have two fully rugged two-in-one tablet laptops that were developed uh, specifically for the public safety market where they came to us three, four years ago and asked us to make that and we did. Uh, so those are heavily deployed today. Um, you know, what, is, what does it look like three years from now? You know, hard to say, uh, but you know, we stand ready to design those products for the future as customer needs change. Uh, I mentioned that rugged Android handheld that was actually developed specifically for uh, tactical environments. So we made a variant of the product for that market um and you know real quick with 5g kind of follow on the nick saying you know we do on the dod side a lot of comms over radios or tactical radios but we're starting to see more people adopt lte for those communications so as that gets more and more secure and certainly as we go to 5g um i think we'll see more of that communication going over lte and incidentally i'm working with someone on nick's team on a project in that arena today so Fantastic. So Panasonic is going to deliver in three years what the user needs and when they need it. And that's fantastic using the latest technology. Lori, how about at 911? You talked about a lot of things that are going on over there. A third of the uh, centers are connected. Perhaps we'll see more. What are we going to see in, in a couple of years? What does the 911 program look like at that point? Well, I think we're trying to put a framework together to enable the system to move forward to, to achieve its ultimate vision which is a nationwide interconnected system of systems, a system where you know, a photograph can be sent by a member of the public to 911 and sent onto the patrol car, a system where a 911 call can be transferred from here in DC to Chicago to Los Angeles and back again, because none of those things are possible now. Uh, we're working with the states to develop resources to interconnect the states we're working uh, with our stakeholders uh, and we're about to release a, a framework that will help us knit this system together at the national level because there's a lot of things that need to happen, both technical and non-technical, to pull that off. Um, so I think the framework will be in place. Uh, whether or not it actually is possible to pull that off in three years, I think it depends on our will to, to do that. Right. And I think a lot of this, I, you talked about the grants program, right? I mean, some of this is funding, right? That you can have a great front framework, but if these local municipalities don't have the funding in order to implement that framework, then there's a sort of a barrier there. Right. And I'm glad to see that you're, you're implementing, uh, you know, an aggressive grants program to allow these capabilities to exist. I love the idea of being able to transmit a photo. It's the first time I've heard of that. I think that's awesome. Jody, uh, how about at iPaws? What's that going to look like in a couple of years? You got a lot of stuff going on there. You know, that's uh, I saw the open iPaws uh, uh, announcement that came out. What, what it's going to look like in a couple of years, and what can the uh, the emergency responder community look forward to? Um, I believe we will definitely see um, more closing of our gap. We'll have more users on board. And that will bring with it improved consistency with sending emergency alerts that will be comprised of more relevant and actionable information in a timely manner to the public. Um, I think as we employ a lot of the requirements outlined in the NDAA, that will help us advance this initiative and get to that point of more assistance, more help to the public, which you know, we're always looking to do, but basically to help them craft better messaging for the public. Glad to hear that. That sounds very encouraging. And I'm um, um, uh, glad that you're getting the support that you need over there to make sure that the entire community gets the support that it needs. All right, Vince, uh, how about at CISA? You've got a lot of activity going on over there in the Emergency Communications Organization. A lot of priorities that you outlined. Uh, you know, what does that look like in two to three years? You know, if you could just sort of, you know, look out over the horizon, what can we expect at this point? So uh, with regards to emergency communications, as we know, there's, a, there's a, a plethora of communications capabilities that are available out there to our first responders. And as Laurie mentioned, uh, and everybody's mentioned here, it's that interoperability between video, data, and voice, uh, and making sure there's that seamless flow of communication to our first responders. So that vision in you know, two to three years uh, is 
you know, as there is a, an incident occurring, whether it's a, you know, a missing child or something to that effect, as, as that photo is able to be sent from the public to the public safety access point, and then transitioning that all the way through the ecosystem, the report, the response, the dispatch, uh, making sure that, that that picture can make it all the way through to a successful you know, conclusion uh, in a timely, in a timely uh, response to that, uh, to that uh, case uh, and recovery of the child. Um, that's what we're shooting for and striving for. And our big movement uh, with regards to that uh, was just released uh, our national emergency communications plan, uh, which is that, that five year strategic roadmap uh, for advancing and achieving interoperable communications that again, that interoperable, secure, and resilient emergency communications ecosystem. That's what we're driving for. Which is fantastic. Now, how often do you guys update that plan? We update that plan uh, on a, on a five-year basis. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So it's uh, uh, very timely. Um, well, uh, let me throw another one at you, a little bit of a curveball here. Top challenge. What's the major challenge? I know funding is always an issue, hiring people, et cetera, et cetera. If you could just put your finger on, you know, so what's the, the, the top challenge that you're facing right now as you try to move this agenda forward? Top challenge, I think we're seeing it, uh, see it now, is, is the frequency and complexity of emergencies moving forward. So how do you respond to a hurricane uh, in, in the pandemic environment? It's that technology is advancing much faster uh, in pace than any other time in our history. And it's what Laurie mentioned with regards to that. It's about the who, not necessarily about the, the technology. All the technology is very important. It's about how do you put governance behind that, planning behind that, uh, and, and assist in training. So it is about the who, not necessarily about the technology, although obviously the technology is extremely important. Our first responders are there to save lives and interoperable communications uh, does that. Great way to close us out, and I really do appreciate that. All right, well, that's going to make it for this uh, show, and uh, we really do appreciate you all taking the time out of your busy sch schedules, and again, thank all of you for everything that you do. I'd like to also thank the sponsors for supporting us on this show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make the program so successful and enjoyable, and most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listening audience out there that tune in every month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of the Federal News Network.